Well, hello and welcome to this special episode of the Adoption and Fostering Podcast with me, Scott Catherine. Uh, himself. Me. Yeah, I'll yeah, code. Himself. And our um, annual returning guests. Oh. No, it's oh. not saying this on guests. They're not co-hosts, they're not hosts, no, no. They're, not, they're not partners in this. <laughs> Absolutely. <sighs> yeah. Paula and Tristan are here with us. Our Hi. Respective partners, husband, wife, whatever, I don't know. Spouse. Whoever they are. Yeah. Evening. <laughs> Evening all. Evening all. <laughs> so we so, don't, we've got no plan, have we? No, we, we don't. Actually, I don't even know if we need to be here. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that could work. That could work on lots of levels. Um, <laughs> but we might need to listen to it before we put it out. <laughs> that would be very important. Um, or shall we just leave it open to them and give them a roundup of what they've been up to since we last saw them? Would that be the easiest thing to do? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because in, in, thir- in 30 seconds, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that came out wrong. Um uh, so, so uh, who should we start with? Uh, Tris? Tris. Got lots of interesting things. Tris. You, uh, <laughs> if you cast your mind back to when you were young and happy this time last year, um, fresh faced, <laughs> golden, flaxen hair. Um, what have you been up to for the last year then? Come on, Tris, what's, what's the world of adoption and fostering and uh, FASD Islanding got, had in store for you this last year? Well, it's been a, a year of firsts for me, I guess. Um, really starting off the year doing something that I never in a million years thought I would do, which was to have to write and give a presentation to uh, the uh, Arctus, which is uh, the Irish Parliament. Um, never done that before. Um, must uh, admit it was a really challenging um, <laughs> piece of work and um, had did, lots of kind did, of nerves on the day. Can I ask if Scott helped? He didn't help at all. Was he actively uh, unhelpful? He uh, he was there. <laughs> <laughs> he was a page turner, and he helped to um, plug in the uh, laptop so that the speech was in front of me. But um, I think that's a really important role. And also, I was there on the way. On the way, you, you were absolutely crapping yourself. <laughs> Um, he was sick on the morning was. through nerves. Yeah. So I think that I had to do the job of being there as a mm. as a as a a, a second mm. in command, keeping him right, keeping him you know on on task. So I think that's very unfair. Mm. But, okay. Yeah. You know whatever. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But this, uh, the um, presentation went down really well, Excellent. and the minister for disability was present, and and um, we. Um, picked up a, a lot uh, of really serious political inquiries about what we do and the services we provide. Um, so that was that was really the, the highlight of the year, I have to say. That was probably the biggest thing I've ever done. Um, and, you know, from that then um, I was asked to speak to a clinical psychologist. I was asked to uh, talk to, to social care workers, um, people in the healthcare system, system all sorts of invitations came from that which was fantastic and really um helped to um raise awareness of FASD island so um that that was a, a really big event and i suppose um the other significant event for for me was that i was invited to um a presentation given by the royal college of surgeons island uh in dublin and i wasn't quite sure why uh, I was on the invite list, but of course I, I, want, I wanted to go along. I was a little bit intrigued and took two of our team with us. Free event, uh, it's going to go anywhere, isn't Yeah, it? there was, it said tea and sandwiches, so. <laughs> well, um, that, that, they had yeah. me at tea and sandwiches. Exactly, <laughs> and it was in a really nice uh, place. And um, yeah, from, from that I made a really good networking connection with um, Variety, the children's charity of Ireland, which probably listeners will know better as the Sunshine Bus people from years oh, gone by. Yes. Um, but they've renamed themselves as Variety, the children's charity. Um, and we have built up a phenomenal relationship with Variety here in Ireland. Um, and they are working really closely with us on both the Hidden Disability Sunflower and FASD Ireland and supporting literally everything we do at every possible opportunity. Um and, you know, they had never really come across FASD, um, but having had conversations with them where 
you know, we highlighted that there's 428 comorbid conditions that really opened their eyes because they said, uh, as a charity, they they look after children with all sorts of disabilities. Mm. And so FASD really fitted well with what they do, as did the sunflower. So um, that was a significant relationship that formed this year. Um, in in home life, I mean, home life just, oh, um, youngest son is... Yeah, young, youngest son is just about doing his A-levels equivalent in the UK. It's called Leaving Cert here. I was in school today talking about how we best support him over the next um, five months. We're still having those conversations. So today was with the Senko, the educational psychologist, um, the uh, pastoral lead and the deputy principal. So we're still having those um, conversations with school, even at at the age of 17 and providing that support and now it's all about points and people might be wondering what I'm talking about when I say it's all about points but in Ireland the Leaving Cert you do a number of exams and you get points for your uh, result and um, youngest son is applying to go to university in Galway and he needs 369 points to get the course that he wants to do. Um, Now he's probably not likely to reach uh, that level but today we identified that there's a process called DARE which is a disability access route to education D-A-R-E um, and that helps him with a number of extra points and uh, there's also extra points because he has ACEs ad- ad- adverse childhood experience and there's also extra points because he has been paid professionally to do some performing arts work uh, so we think that we've been able to gather about another 120 points to get him towards the score that he needs. So the rest is now in his uh, hands for June when he sits the exams all the way through the month of June. But can, it has taken the pressure off him a bit. Can I ask you a question? Because I, I was thinking if we had this, if we were talking about our children maybe three or four years ago, both of us as a couple, we'd probably be having really different conversations, wouldn't we? Do you, yes. <laughs> in terms of the the kind of the impact of early adversity and behaviour and us how we manage the behavior how we were coping with the behavior so it like listening to you there feels really optimistic there's real sense of hope mm. i'm sure they've, i'm sure you have your moments yeah yeah <laughs> and you know one of the questions one of the pastoral lead today um he, he raised a point and it's my famous the fabulous saying that we always uh, drive home to people we speak to uh, in professional and home life which is you know take some time look over your shoulder see where you come from mm. Um, and he said, when when you first arrived, when, when he first arrived in the school uh, five years ago, uh, we weren't really uh, sure how his uh, education was going to go. We weren't sure if he was going to be able to sustain uh, Irish high school education. Uh, he said, and here we are today talking about university. Yeah. And I said, well, I, I just want to trump that a little bit. Yeah. I said, um, when he, when we were first sitting down with social workers planning him coming home to live with us for the first time, the plan was that he was going to go to a special school and that he probably wouldn't be able to have a mainstream education at all. Mm. So, so when you look at the overall picture, yeah, um, he's come a million miles from where mm. he was at the age of seven. So 10 years it's taken and a lot of work for, for him and he's really applied himself you know yeah. i don't take away the effort he's put in himself um but with the right supports and the right people around him um it's produced the success that he's currently still in school we're still having that conversation about education he still wants to be in school in his own words it's where he feels safe and you know we have to we we must Pay attention to that. You know, we have to have a plan B in case he doesn't get to go to university because of the results. Mm. But he feels safe in education. So today we talked about a plan B as well, and that's all well and good. Um, but yeah, it's 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 a huge leap forward in ten years, and it's a um, massive amount of progress in the last five since he arrived in Ireland with us. Mm. That's really encouraging, isn't it? Because I think that. Um, I know, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a friend and we talk about stuff that isn't necessarily for public airing, but I know that there's been some pretty dark days along the path. And um, and so it's, you can take sort of a level of um, pride, can't you, when you take stock and go, oh, yeah, we, we, we weathered some storms and um, 
you must be the, the pair of you. you must be really proud of him and the, the rest of the family as well because it's not just it's not your youngest it's the rest all of your all of your children have they're doing okay aren't they yeah I, I i have to say i saw um a post on linkedin tonight and you know it takes me back really thinking about looking on linkedin and seeing some of my uh, children's work on there but uh, tonight an aircraft was pulled out of a hangar at shannon that had been resprayed into the new design of Brathens from Sweden, the, the Swedish airline. Uh, and middle son was responsible for that work. Now, he didn't paint it all himself, but he was responsible for all of the tech marks on it. So <laughs> all of the writing that you see on the side of an aircraft, he did himself, uh, you know, at 24 years old. It's, it's miraculous <laughs> because, again, let's go back to the age of seven and we were told he's never going to be a rocket scientist. Well... He's not a rocket scientist, <laughs> but my goodness me, he's putting aircraft in the sky. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, middle son, little bit of success there. Yeah. On, and it was on LinkedIn. Oldest son, well, um, as you know, we're grandparents. And uh, I think that that's probably personally the biggest achievement this year in our home lives, isn't it? Yeah. Is to um, realise that actually with adoption and fostering, you can go beyond just the children that are placed. You know, we, we we look back to when we first became parents and it was all about, well, they'll leave home at 18 and that'll be it. And here we are, you know, 25, 24, 17 um, and grandparents. And it, it, it kind of was something that was never on my radar that I would be a parent, <laughs> let alone grandparent. So it's been quite a, an amazing and year I, in the home. Yeah, and I think that's probably why it's a little bit more kind of, raw for us emotionally to become grandparents because you know becoming parents was a massive thing for i mean it's a massive thing for everybody but for us it was a it was a huge yeah. huge huge back then because it it only just been the law had only just changed and you mm. know all that sort of stuff and now i mean god blimey when you look at the figures of same-sex adoption on lgbt qua or whatever you call it um adoptions these days a massive amount i think it's five and ten or six and ten or something isn't like. it about 20 percent? isn't it something it's, it was, it, it's it, like, yeah but it's it's huge. It's yeah. huge. Um, you know, I'm I, I'm constantly being followed. I mean, I am the OG. Let's let's just put that out there. I am the OG gay adoption dad on all the social platforms. <laughs> but I occasionally get followed by other people who've done it, and and um, it's really like I'd, I just, is, is OG old gay? No, that's oh. original. The OG. Oh, but you get because you're on there as that gay adoption dad. You get quite a lot of oh, very unusual. Well, they do. Yes, he gets <laughs> lots of inquiries about whether he'll be somebody's daddy. <laughs> Um, but that's another story. But oh, it's um, getting very hot in here. <laughs> very but I think um, that you know some of the ones that I do follow back, or if if you know, I mean, I'm you, I, I'm not the sort of person just to follow people back because they follow me kind of thing. I have to, you know, find something I'm interested in within the feed. But a lot of them, you know, I'm I'm not saying they take it for granted, but it's just something that's you know <clears throat> they've kind of grown up knowing mm. that they could become parents if they wanted to. Whereas for us, that wasn't ever, ever an option. You know, nobody, mm. nobody knew that we would be able to do that um, through, through adoption. Mm. Um, you know, some, some people do it through surrogacy, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, um, so I think in terms of being a grandparent, that, that made it quite, it was more, it was more kind of so, emotional for us. Yeah, and forgive my ignorance, but um, is, it, is there a sort of a not that many gay adoptive or same-sex couples who are grandparents is it kind of a are you sort of, uh charting new territory i think i think we are i think certainly in ireland we're probably the only couple that mm. have gone on to become grandparents through adoption but um i'm guessing because the numbers were a little bit ahead of us in the uk at the time there's probably a few in the uk mm. um but again it's not something that's widely publicized mm. And I think if you know people, you know people, don't you? Yeah. Uh, not everybody's on social media. I mean, God, there used to be a time where I knew everybody on Twitter and everybody knew me on Twitter. And now, you know, this that's just gone to pot a little bit. But, um, you know, I think, um, you know, cutting, cutting back on the kind of social stuff that we used to do when the boys were younger, we don't, you know, we, we don't kind of um, socialise with people that we may have socialised with when the boys were younger because we don't, you know, the boys and their friends who were adopted have kind of mm. gone their own ways and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I've always said that. So, you know, we were never in the LGBTQIA um, support group 
thing because I I prefer to be just part of a you know a, a group of people rather than you know a mm. minority of people kind of thing. So I don't know if I'm using the right words, but you know you can use whatever you word you want. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So I think that was um, yeah that was definitely a, a, an event or the event of the of you well you you yeah I mean um, she was born at four fifty. 448. 448 see our faculties uh, she was born at 448 in the morning um i was on a plane at 750 and i landed at five past nine and held her in my arms at two o'clock the same <laughs> days so it wasn't even uh 12 hours old by the time i got to hold her and it was a marvelous thing to be able to do mm-hmm. and um scott had oh, scott was already in the uk uh when she was born but he was waiting down in london to meet me um so you know we were both there to hold her at the earliest opportunity to be fair and it was just amazing that we were able uh to to take advantage of travel transport links to to do that and and the timing was just perfect so it was really really good and when i think back to covid when we couldn't travel anywhere Mm. i mean if that had happened during covid i i don't know how we would have felt you know, because we wouldn't be able to just jump on a plane and, and, mm. and go. Um, and I think it's very easy to forget the, the restrictions and all the kind of the different life that we had to lead through mm-hmm. through that. But I will say that it's quite amusing when I think back on it, actually. Um, and that day, arriving at the hospital and meeting um, our uh, son, Fraser, who is the father of, of our little granddaughter, um, and how nonplussed he was by it. But I think that, again, it goes back to this um, this kind of wall that's put up so that we're not, you mm. know, we don't see that emotion kind of thing. Um, but, you know, when he was, he was the one that cut the cord um, and he was in absolute floods of tears when he was doing that. So we're told. Mm. But, you know, I think that um, even when it comes down to new life coming into, into the world, I think it just proves that <clears throat> we don't always see that emotion either. And, you know, he loves her to bits, obviously. And, you know, we've seen him grow in confidence. Like, you know, the first couple of days when he was holding her, she she was like this little china doll because he'd never hold, held a baby before. Mm. Uh, so when he was holding her, you could tell he was very tentative and very kind of wary and stuff like that. And now he's like, oh, he's not slinging her around by her ankles, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he kind of just goes in, scoops her up and he's, you know, he's away mm. with her kind of. And she knows him and, you know, she knows his voice mm. and she knows when he mm. comes in and all that sort of stuff. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing to see. Absolutely mm. beautiful, gorgeous thing mm-hmm. to see. Especially because we've never had a baby now, so. Yeah. Wonderful. Excellent stuff. It's really positive, you know, like yeah. to to kind of hear that story for other people out there, for adopters, you know, that maybe have the loss of baby, you know, and, and mm. think actually, you know, there is hope, you know, and, and I think that it's really, really good. It's a good story. It's a good outcome. And, you know, you've got this beautiful little girl because she is, she's gorgeous and very loving parents. And like you say, you know, seven years ago, whatever, who would have thought? But you know good news i know i know one person with regrets that's my bank manager because it's costing us a fortune <laughs> uh, every time i walk past a, a baby shop i'm dashing in so everybody thought i wouldn't be like that you know they all thought i'd just be here whatever um but actually I'm, i've been the one out of both of us oh. who's uh been just oh look at this look at this look at this well not really look at this i'm going to tap my card here and tap my card <laughs> there and tap my card here and just worry about it later <laughs> So what what are you called then? Are you granddad? Grand? Are you? Grumps. Well, as a joke, I, I mean, jokingly, uh, uh, it is a joke, isn't it? Yeah. But, allegedly, it was a joke. They called me grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> so he's grumps, and and but I, I'll give Lorna a Jew, who is uh, Fraser's girlfriend and April's mum. Um, Lorna does say grumps and pops, or yeah. grumpy and pops are coming, and she talk because she's always talking about us because. Mm-hmm. We always said the one thing that we were concerned about was living so far away and mm-hmm. you know babies babies grow fast you know mm-hmm. and yeah. obviously they get used to the people around them and all that sort of stuff so that's why i've been trying to visit once a month at least so that um you know not that much time passes yeah as she and i know she's still quite young but actually she, you know she might recognize mm-hmm. my voice we don't, we don't know how mm-hmm. you know yeah how, how she works like that um but yeah, I, I suspect she'll call us what she calls us. In the same way, that's you know that's what we said when the boys come along. You know, we had we were asked when we were being assessed what we would like to be mm-hmm. called. And I think we even said then we were 
We weren't going to we say, it was, gonna up say it, was to up to, it was up to the boys what they called us. And mm-hmm. they did. They went their own way with it. So I think, you know, as a baby, you, you obviously use salutations for mummy, daddy, granddad, nanny or nana mm-hmm. or grandma or whatever. Yeah. But I think actually what she ends up saying will, might be very different to what we expect, you know. Yeah. And mm-hmm. and let's face it, when they when they do start talking, it doesn't mm-hmm. always come out the same way that we say it. So you know, mm-hmm. you could be called anything really. Can you? Yeah. You know, my my goddaughter, she calls um her grandmother Moosey for some reason. We don't know why. Mm-hmm. She's done it since she was able to talk. Since she started talking, and, and she's still called me. We all call her Moosey now because mm-hmm. that's um we yeah. don't know why. That's just the way it is. Well, it's like, it's like Leah's oldest daughter. She um, Who's Leah? Hmm? Right. Leah, my friend. Well, All right, sorry. I was going to say it. My friend Leah, who you know. <laughs> just oh. random person. Sorry. Everyone knows Leah. Um, <laughs> friend of the show, she, actually. She listens to the shop podcast. So her, hey, her daughter, oh, Ruby, oh. called her granddad um, Bice when she was just a little, you know, starting to talk Bice. And so they're now, you know, she's now a teenager. Mm. And they call him Bice, that's his name. You know, that's kind of really normal. So, yeah, it's quite nice to have. Children are peculiar. Have these, yeah. Um, on another note then, so Mrs. Coates. Me. Yeah. Share with the group. What have you been up to the last year? What's what, What's what been going through all your head with the kids and right, life okay. in general? Yeah, um, well, I'm always busy. Never stop, all the time. Very big house. Lots of family. Family living here. Um you know, as I was kind of explaining a little bit before, there was kind of something happened before Christmas, which kind of turned my world upside down a little bit and made me like have a look at my life. And because, you know, I have family gatherings, I have big Sunday dinners and I do it and everybody gets what they like. So Rosa doesn't like Sunday dinner, so she gets chicken nuggets and chips and everybody gets the Sunday dinner. And I, and I kind of classy. I accommodate everybody. And by the way, Rosa's baby eats the best of food. She sits and eats chicken nuggets and he eats the best of food. She makes oh, fish really? ca- yeah, she makes fish cakes from scratch. Yeah, she's, <laughs> she's amazing. She won't eat them. And she she makes she's got to have a healthy diet every day. And her <laughs> diet is shocking. Yeah. Anyway. So so kind of it's been, you know, she had a baby, um, moved away a little bit further, but she's doing really, really well. But I kind of I've started to like think about myself and think, you know, I'm just Giving and giving, giving to everybody and to him. You know, don't bring me into this. <laughs> uh, we knew, um, we Scott's, knew. Scott's been to the house. He knows. He knows. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen him with my own eyes. And yeah. so you know, we have we have guests around, and I make it all happen, and I accommodate people, and I'm kind, and I get drinks, and I make sure people are happy. And it's it, it's kind of it's it's ha- it's how I was built as a child. My mum had me late in life, and she always used to say to me, "You're here to keep the family together." You know, and there was this kind of expectation on me that I had to be a gatherer. So that was what's kind of happened to me. Mm. And so I do it. And if there's any disruption again from family, I get myself really, really upset and worried about it. And I need to gather, gather, gather. And I can hear the words of my mum ringing in my head saying, you know, you've, you're here to keep the family together. And it's almost like my mission. And so... A therapist I talked to a while ago, she kind of said it's very unusual in adopted families to see, you know, for, for all the children to kind of come back. She said they all keep coming back and there's all of this happens, this stuff, but actually they all come back. And, uh, you know, and I, you know, and I kind of that was in my head, but I've kind of got much more busy. I, I look after Elsie, my granddaughter, full time. Um I've got my 12 year old Shania, and you know, it's kind of. I've and got, she's turning into a teenager. We have to say that. Oh my goodness. <laughs> she's changing. Well, I tell but, you, you know, she's leaning got, into that. I've got my horse, which is my pleasure. But then, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, finding people having a go at me about you've spent time with your horse and not for me. And, you know, and I, 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 you know, I was just constantly throwing out, you know, like being here and, and putting off that so that I could this and. Rosa getting upset with me because, you know, I wasn't here when she arrived and wasn't spending enough time with her. But I just, I kept, I got to the stage where I was thinking, I'm spread so thin. I just can't cope. You know, it's really difficult. And then I get so tired, you know, and I think I realised nobody actually notices or does. <laughs> Al does, allegedly. Um, But I just kind of thought, 
who's doing things for me? Who is actually looking out for me? I'm the one that gets into trouble if I haven't come up with the goods. Nobody challenges Al. You know, none of the kids come and say, well, you haven't spent time with me. You know, when he has too much people time, he goes in the garden and cuts the grass. He comes in here and <laughs> does whatever he has to do. You know, he goes and chops wood in the front of the house. He he's, he can always find a way. Nobody, nobody goes, oh, where's dad? And I just kind of, hold on a minute. I've just got to draw a line here. I can't, I can't keep living like this because it's expect, because I've given and given and given so much. It's expected. And so nobody kind of says, oh, you know, I sat with Rosa one day and I just said, look, and I, took, I explained to her, I said, you know, I'm 62. And I said, I love seeing you and I love you coming with Isaiah. Really proud, very proud of you. But you've got to understand that I've got a horse. And if you arrive on a Saturday, I'm not going to be there until tea time. You know, that's my day. Rosa got it. She totally got it. And she literally shifted in that moment. Um, Do you think that that in thought is part of and something that's maybe of all parents who've got children with complicated stories is that we we keep we keep helping we keep going and we we are helicopter parents and we are parents who are I, I think, like stepping I think in well, i think there's uh, paula just alluded to something else there and i think that her own parents had programmed her particularly her mother it sounds had programmed her to be the, the gatherer mm-hmm. and so even though her mother passed on a number of years ago uh, Paula still sits in that role that's been programmed mm-hmm. from birth to be that gatherer. Mm-hmm. And I think that all of us are very guilty of living out our lives as we were programmed mm-hmm. uh, yeah. without question, because that's what our parents do. That's nurturing, right? Um, so I think there's, to me, listening to you, there's a there's that element of you recognise now that you need to change and that mm-hmm. that programming is no longer fit for purpose for you at, at this point in your life but also like Al just said we are as um, parents who've suddenly uh, got children in our lives that are, have been exposed to all sorts of uh, situations that have that um, kind of adverse experience we mm. are helicopter parents as he said mm. we we fly in yeah. we make good and then we step mm. back and let it roll out mm-hmm. so I think there's two things there mm-hmm. uh, that Definitely. you've identified. Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, yes, because I, I still will be the parent who is there, the helicopter parent, you know, and look after them. You know, I still want them all to come and I still want the big family gatherings on a Sunday and all of that, but I'm not chasing it anymore. And if they want to come, you know, they can, you know, the kids mm-hmm. that don't live with us can come seven days a week if they want. They're very welcome. The door's open. You know, the door's always open. You know, I don't want to have to make appointments to see them, but we're here for them. Yeah, and so, I think you've, and you've hit another really valid point that we, we talk a lot to parents of older children in our daytime work. And there is this thing about <clears throat> we're all, we, we all um, parent our children, how we learned, how we were parented ourselves. So we learned the art of parenting from our own parents. We, mm. we see we do. And that's the style of parenting that we all grew up with and that we all then pass on. But there comes a point when our children reach adulthood and for care experienced children, that's a little bit older because they tend to have that um, lower um, developmental age to their chronological age. But eventually we have to change our parenting style so that we're now parenting adults. And Mm -hmm. that's something that none of us of our age group will have experience of because when we were 18, 19, we all left home pretty much yeah, in, yeah. in that generation. We all left home. Mm. So our parents, and, you know, my mum loves to give me advice on how to parent <laughs> my children, but she actually <laughs> stopped parenting me at, at 17 when I left home, you know? Yeah. So as a, as a, uh, a an adult, my mum my mom never had to parent me in the house. She never had to go behind me because I've moved out and left home. Yeah. So now in this, in, in the 2023, 2024, where we are now, um, we've got lots and lots of young adults living at home, partly because we're in financial crisis across the world. Mm. Um, but also um, with the care experience community, they are going to be at home later in life. Yeah. Um, and so there's nobody out there currently that is advising 
how do you parent an adult? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something mm-hmm. that we all we all learn as we go. We we all make lots of mistakes. We all get it wrong. Yeah. And the worst thing is because we all want to be really good parents, we beat ourselves up for it. And mm-hmm. we have to stop doing that. I, I find it so hard because I like you, I literally the day I did my GCSEs and I had a I had a job to start. I got my GCSEs on like the 31st of August. I started a job on the 5th of September. And my parents, mm-hmm. it wasn't that they it wasn't that they kicked me out of the nest. It was literally that they just sort of like they just started to treat me like an adult. It, yeah. was, it, it wasn't it wasn't like this act of cruelty. It was like, oh well, you've got your own money now, and get on with your, you manage it, and you get on with your life, and just and I, I think that I have just so struggled to really to to I think my children need me to be as more involved, much more involved in that, and it just it's like oil and water. I just feel that I'm overstepping this mark that and it feels like i'm i'm in it's feel like an invasion of privacy to kind of yeah if i so i'll say you know i will say are you all right and i'll go yes and i think that is that's i'm not that's not my that's job yeah that's it's not, it's not <laughs> i feel i feel I, I feel really intrusive on but or I'm, I'm stepping over a line to then go and say well are you okay you know how's you doing with your money and how are you doing with your job and how are you doing well whatever it is uh, yeah really i've really struggled as they've gone into adulthood to do you know, I think it's, it's interesting in terms of how what kind of roles you take on as well as parents of adults. So as an example, even now, like, you know, so the boys will come to me for the emotional nurturing piece. And then if there's any problems, they'll always go to Tris. Hmm. Financial or, you know, they've got a bill that they don't know what, you know, anything like that. that or the cops are at the door. Or the, or the police are at the door or something like yeah, that. Yeah, wiring a house, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that, that's proof of kind of their upbringing of of what they saw us doing yeah. for them as parents but it's also hard because i very much i'm i'm quite blasé now because i say look if he doesn't answer like i'm i'm not taking up your point paula but it's a similar point mm. so I say well i haven't heard from jacob i whatsapped him an hour ago i say yeah but he doesn't read whatsapp tris you have to go on snapchat well i don't have snapchat Right. Okay. So I message him. I message him, and, and thirty seconds later, I get a reply. Right? <laughs> because, but Tris gets too impatient, and then it's like you send him a rant, going, "Why aren't you replying to my messages? I was saying you this an hour ago." Blah 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 blah. And Jacob will just come back very bluntly and say, "Because I don't read WhatsApp. That's it. I've not got the notifications on for it." Mm-hmm. So blah blah blah. Um, but then, like sometimes we'll get a message that happened the other day. I won't go into any great detail about it, but we got a message the other day, and the next thing I hear these feet stomping through the kitchen, and it's Tris, and he's going, did you, read, did you read that? Did you read that message? Did you read that message? It's just come through. I said, yeah, why? Oh, it's just really stressed me out, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, just chill. It's from an adult. <laughs> Nobody's dying. You know, just chill down there, mate, because you know, I'm, I'm very much like that. I'm very, I'm not, it, of course, if somebody was in, you know, in trouble or in pain or, you know, had hurt themselves, of course I'm going to run to them. That's that's not what I'm getting at. But I'm just, I, I tend to now not get so stressed over things that like that. However, like Paula, I will do that thing of the gathering thing. So, you know, um, you know, I, know, I now kind of accept that one of our children will never be with us at Christmas because we mm. live in a different country and he doesn't get the same time off that we get. Um, it's far too expensive for us to come over as a family to to you know spend time with him all that sort of stuff um so i'm constantly looking at when's the opportunity for us all to get together um but then there's the other, the other side of that is is you know like sorting out the little niggles between them all and trying to be the the fixer of that mm. and then the other thing as well is you know um you know we've got a 24 year old who still doesn't know what a bloody washing machine is and you know yeah i'm going to do that yeah i'm going to clean it out my car when you're going to i'm this is the cracking yeah. one just for Christmas. Yeah, I'm going to get my car validated. Oh, are you? Because you've had it for two years and it's never been cleaned once. So, you know, good luck with that. And and I said to him, I said, you do know that your niece is coming over in February. I said, and, you know, you're taking time off. So, therefore, you can actually take them out for the day. And blah. she's not going to my car. I'm not being responsible for driving a baby around in a car. And I'm like, well, we're not going to be doing it either, you know, because we're going to be at work for the majority of it, of the time. We're going to have some time off, obviously. Um, but it's that kind of thing, you know, and you just think mm. you, you kind of you fit into these roles of what people expect. Mm-hmm. And I think for us as two men as well, I think that they balance that out between the two of us. So we we're not one and we're not 
the other. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So the, if they weren't getting attention from us, it would be from yeah. both of us. Mm-hmm. Attention. <laughs> Not just from one of us. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and the other thing as well is, is uh, you know, Al doesn't really immerse himself with people. And I've seen that because I've been there, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, he's very much, you know, he'd rather sit in his little bank cave and, mm-hmm. yeah, and potter away. Um, and duck out and say hi. And, and like the life and soul is here for 10 minutes and then, you know, disappears. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been at yours when I was gone for a little disco nap. You know, yeah. he's had <laughs> half an hour. I think we're thinking, oh, is he, has yeah, he got I remember been? that. <laughs> I went up for a sleep halfway through a party. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, has he gone for a poo or what is he doing? I don't know. But, um, and, and that's the difference, you know, um, whereas Tris would do that. Tris would just nip off. Mm. He, yeah. would, he, he would actually say to me, he'd say, he'd whisper to me, he'd just say, right, I'm going to bed. And has, he has <laughs> done that. And he's just gone to bed. And we've not seen him the rest of the night. And I just have to make up an excuse and say, oh, he wasn't feeling well or something like that. So I think that, um, I'm not I'm not dimin- diminishing what you've gone through, Paula, because I know I know it has been difficult. But I think, you know, as parents of adults as well, you don't know where that line is. Mm. Sometimes it's it takes what you've just gone through for you to, to push pull yourself back and go. Actually, do you know what? Mm. I'm, I'm I'm not doing I'm not doing this for me anymore. I'm doing it for everybody else. So I need to start looking at me. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? I've been at yours when you've had to go and do the horse when you picked me up from the airport as an example and you said I'm really sorry I'm really sorry but I've got to do, go and do the horse and I'm like you've done me the favour of coming to pick me up from the airport why would you be sorry about having to go and do something that's part of your life mm. mm-hmm. yeah um, yeah yeah I mean it's you know it's it's my thing uh, you know and so it kind of it, it's got to the stage now where I, you know we live in a huge house and mm. which we've, we've lived in two huge houses and it's been great and it's been right. This house was a 10-year plan because it was when we were having difficulties, you know, with our teenager and we kind of came here out in the sticks to kind of get yeah. away. And it served its purpose. It's not been a happy home because um, yeah. we have had lots of lots of sad things happened in this house and, you know, lots of happy things. But, you know, it's, 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 it's not my heart house. The last house was very much a heart house, but this one has been kind of, you know, bricks and mortar and kept us, kept us clean and dry and warm. But, um, well, not warm. Or, or, <laughs> but, um, or, or dry. Yes. But, um, <laughs> or you know, clean but, but the kind of situation that happened just before Christmas pushed me and I just sat with Al and I said, we need to sell the house. We need to downsize. Mm. And it's the first time we've talked about it, but it, it just both of us. It was like, yeah, this is absolutely. Um, <laughs> Email the podcast, you know, and it, and it's funny because I, I do. I, I mean, I get when I sell a car, I feel almost sad for the car as if I've let it down, and so, but I don't. <laughs> and it's true, I do. I can. Oh, I feel. I feel really bad, but anyway, that's just me. But you know, yeah. the house. I just kind of I've got the stage now where you know we've decorated it lovely we've done lots of lovely things to it and it's great and I love it but I just I I feel cut off emotionally from yeah. it and I, and we're we're very very limited what we can buy because we've got Anne who's obviously in the wheelchair who needs downstairs accommodation lots of room because yeah. she crashes into everything even in our huge house and <laughs> um, she needs downstairs showers so you know We'll have very specific needs. We want to stay local for Shania to be able to be a teenager in a high school with mates on a doorstep that she can walk to because he or she can't do it. What could possibly go wrong? Um, but I think this is the bigger picture about us kind of resetting our relationship with our children because we're, we're in a house now where they all can come back and like physically come back. Um, yeah. With the next house, they'll, we'll, so the, the, we'll have a spare room, but we don't have room for you all. So the, you are on your own now. The, 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 the safety net is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. It's funny because it's like, because, the, you know, they suddenly start to discuss like the other day it was when I, you know, Christmas Day, where will I have, where will I be able to sit with my presents? You know, because they've all got a space in our living room. They all have like grandma's is there and this is her, da, da, da. you know, and Rose is like, where, where will my place be? And then Kirsty was saying something about, you know, overnight and, and you know, waking up in the morning and I went, You'll be in your own place. Went, All right, okay. Said, Maybe you can invite us to your house. You know, yeah. it's funny because suddenly the gatherings have, are important. You know, mm. you know they know yeah. they are, and it's almost like, right, okay, it, this safety thing has yeah. just gone. And but it needs to. But 
we will always be there, to, you yeah. know, to to kind of help them, support them. Of course, we will as parents. That you yeah. know, the, like, the need. There comes a time, Paula, where you need to pass the baton on, yeah. so that they're doing the Christmas Absolutely. day and being invited round. Mm. And yeah. how, how long do you have to be to pass that baton on? Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. uh, um, I had a message off one of my children this week, Scott, which you will find very interesting. She said, "Dad." Uh, do you have do you have any spare or old podcasting stuff? Oh. <laughs> I said, well, "What sort of stuff do you mean?" And she went, "Like mics and that." And I went, "Might do." And she went, "Because I'm starting a podcast." <laughs> you guess which child it is. I wonder. I wonder. Does it begin with an R by chance? Yeah. <laughs> with an R. Well, a lot of our children begin with an R, so half of them begin with an R. But yes, it's that. Yeah. One. Well, yeah, yeah, that one. I don't know which one that is. Yeah. But, you know, but relationships change. I think there's real hope. You know, we got a, a Christmas card and a gift off, off Rihanna this year, which is lovely. Um, yeah, you, you know, said her name there. Uh, I said, did say her name there, but, you know, she, you know, she, yeah, so she and, is you know, she, 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 You know, she, she gave me a ring and she said, I've got some presents. Um, when can I drop them off? She has yeah. never, ever bought us a gift. Ever, ever, ever. <laughs> and, I mean, she's got a partner now, you know, so... Obviously. So, but but the thing is, but, that life goes on, and you kind of think that you, you can get to such dark places, mm-hmm. and it's not not it's not the end. It's not over till it's oh, over. That's something. what I was just going to say. I mean, I know that, like with Fraser as an example, we had a very strange relationship with him as he went into his adult years because he saw himself as an adult. As, as soon as he turned eighteen, he was like, "Right, I'm an adult now. I could do what I like." Yeah. And what he didn't realise was he, we still had a seven-year-old in the house. So for him to come in steaming drunk at three in the morning, and I, Fraser isn't the quietest when he's sober, never mind when he's drunk. Um, you know, that kind of thing. We had to say to him, look, you know, it's not that we're putting a curfew on you, but you need to be in at a certain time before we lock the door. Um, and our relationship with him did get quite strained, didn't it? And yeah. you know, he decided that he was moving out. I put a bale of, bale of hay in the shed so he'd sleep no, we on that. We had chickens. We had chickens. <laughs> we had, we had, we had um, uh, straw and, and stuff in the shed. Um, and there was that was never locked. Um, no, I'm just telling the, the real story, not your version of it. <laughs> I like my story. Uh, I we like did. His we, we, we yeah. also we also locked locked front door if he wasn't in because we told him we would. Um, he didn't have a key mm. um, because he was at a point in his life where he, lo- he lost mm. endless wallets, endless keys, um, and he would sleep in the shed. Um, and he would come in with straw hanging out his arse, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And it's quite <laughs> funny. Um, but he knew that would happen. Um, but we couldn't, you know, we couldn't upset mm. the rest. Of because he wanted to have a night out kind of thing mm. um, but it, did, it started to get strained and, and he made the decision to move out he moved out with his own girlfriend um, and it was again it was it was quite difficult for the first six months to a year because we didn't want to put ourselves onto him by just popping in mm. because he was now independent and we didn't want him to think that we were coming in to make sure that he was doing things right or this or the next thing and when mm. we did see him we very conscious of that all the time but actually what it ended up being was the partner that he was with at the time, she was putting restrictions on him that made us feel like we couldn't just pop in as well. Um, whereas now, obviously there's distance between us. So that helps because actually when we see him, we enjoy his company. We think he enjoys us. <laughs> we don't know. But that, we know there's an end game. We know yeah. that we're coming away. And so it's yeah. not intense. You know? yeah. And that, that's mm. important. Yeah. Um, whereas, you know, Brandon's still living with us. He's gotten... As far as we're away or anyway, he's got no intentions of going anywhere. You know, he did move out for a little while, but he came back. Mm. Um, and he's no hassle. He, you know, he contributes financially to the house. Um, you know, I'll do his laundry for him because he won't otherwise, because he's not that organised, you know. He, he does mm. make sure that no food ever goes out of date. Yeah, mm. exactly. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so so I think that, you know, we're, 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 we've all got our own unique kind of... yeah journey haven't we mm-hmm. and I think that you know what 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 I've picked up on tonight as well is that whilst we were probably quite firmly um against doing the parenting thing the same way our parents did we've probably just done it exactly the same way with a few tweaks in there because I was always of the impression that you know I would I would do some things the same but not everything because mm-hmm. there were some things I hated about but I've probably I've probably ended up being like that to be honest mm. with you um and actually 
it, it, it's proof as well that you do get to a certain point where you go, actually, do you know what? I can't be doing this for everybody else mm. anymore. Yeah, I've got to, I've got to do stuff for me again. Yeah, and, it's, and it's I think hard. I think we forget that because I'm not at that stage yet. But yeah, and and I heard it sort of phrased is that there comes a moment in everyone's life, isn't it, where you you, you are the main, you are the story. And then, you know, we get to a point where we're not the story anymore. We're not, yeah. we're not centre stage. We're not in the spotlight. And I think that's what we're mm. working out as well. We're, it's our time to maybe, yeah, well, there's other things for us to do. Like for you, there's, there's FASD Island. There's, you know, for yeah. us, there's all the stuff we want to do. Mm -hmm. But we need to let our children shine and shine that, and be, mm -hmm. build their own stage and become the centre of it and not have us tinkering on it, moving the prop around, props around, stretching so, that analogy too thin. So there's always that risk, isn't it, that it's seen as, um, so, you know, I, I see it as um, I don't want to be the person that goes in. So, you know, with even with our granddaughter, I'm always asking permission. Hmm. For, and and that, it, this is my view on it, not necessarily anybody else's view, but I don't want to be the one that goes in and does too much or, hmm. you know, seems mm -hmm. to be taken over. Mm -hmm. So I'm always asking permission because I'm not April's mum or dad. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, we, we had a, we had a, a thing from both our parents, actually, um, because Fraser's not very good at organising himself. Um, so that when, when April was first born, our parents were coming to us saying, when are we meeting April? When are we meeting April? Now, they're the great-grandparents. Mm. Yeah. Not the parents, not the grandparents, they're the great-grandparents. Mm -hmm. But also, the parents are adults. So why don't you, rather than coming to us, yeah. Like, yeah. Us, why don't you just go straight to them and say, when am I getting to meet my great-granddaughter? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. kind of um, because that's that's a hard conversation, yeah. and you mm. know, um, I I I I kind of push back on that a little bit because I'm like, well, whoa, mm. you know, they're adults, you're adults, mm -hmm. yeah. you normally speak to them, so why don't you just you know yeah. leave me out mm -hmm. because I, I can't make that decision for you. Yeah. And so I'm very much, I'm also very much like you know I don't want to go in, don't want to take over and stuff like that. I don't want to be seen to be meddling and stuff like that um, because. That's it's not my time. That's mm. it's their time now. They're the parents. Mm -hmm. I was the parent, and yeah. I'm the grandparent. So, mm -hmm. what are you? Do you need to? Do you need to go and excuse yourself? Mm. He's doing that thing. He wants to go to bed. He's just yawned, but he's grunting right. at the same time. <laughs> Is it past your bedtime, it's grand, Trace? It's a granddad thing, apparently. Al. Ah, uh, right. Uh, yeah, I know all about that. <laughs> I've been no. at work all day. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that. Um, my point of saying all that was, I think that, you know, sometimes it can be seen as um, interfering or, but I think actually it's just our natural want to make sure everybody's all right. Um, mm, yeah. And, you know, we've yeah. been to your school and you are the perfect host. You are absolutely the perfect Thank host. You. you look after everybody. There's always food. Um, she likes your cigarettes. <laughs> she massages your feet. Yeah. See, I think the next cigars. I think the cigars now, darling. Love the, cigarette. The next time that some that Paula feels that way, right? I think the next time that happens, she needs to go out to the, where the wood is and go take the axe and start chopping wood. Front there, out of everybody yeah. in that. Yeah, imagine <laughs> her. She's chopping wood. She's chopping wood. <laughs> that would make them sit up and think, "Oh my God, what have mm. I just done?" We've broken. I mean, it's funny because years ago, I mean, I won't remember this, but I remember it as clear as day. But. There was one that the, we had kind of the, the, the three, only the three kids and I was poorly, really poorly. I was at work and got to the point I was so poorly I had to go to bed. I mean, Anne is obviously capable and yeah. so she was like there and I said, look, just you're just going to have to ha look after them. I feel so ill. And I went to bed and got in. I came in from work and he, he just opened his arms and he went, what are you doing? You run the ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't. Yeah. You this can't remember. 20, this is twenty years ago. This I'm a changed man. But <laughs> you know what? It, it kind of it was one of those moments where I just thought, my goodness, I can't even be ill. You know. Yeah. And that's. But that's kind of you know you know it's like sitting with a therapist. That that's how I feel. I feel you know I run the ship. That's everybody knows that I run this ship, and I do run the ship. And mm -hmm. a part of that is my fault because I've done it do you know what I mean and I've had the crap pulled back at you know thrown back at me and everything and I've just taken it and you know it's just that kind of when I said that it's just one of those times where I just remember it and I think you know but my fault 
you know, my fault that you can't come in from work, see me in bed ill and go, what can I do for you? Surely you there's a statute of limitations on this sort of um, incident. Um, yeah. Six <laughs> years. Yeah. Years. 2001. No, I, I I think that um, I would I would totally relate to that, Paula, because I feel exactly the same. And, and yeah, I've made a rod from home back by being the person that does dinner, that does the laundry, that does, cleans, that does, mm-hmm. you know, my weekends. I mean, you know, I I do only work part time um, officially. Mm-hmm. Although Tris would have you believe I only do about three hours a week, but I do do more than that because actually he'll ring me up on a Saturday when he's in work and he'll say, "Can you just do this? Can you just do that?" So I've got that. But and you're a full time podcaster. Well, <laughs> but my weekends are, are filled with doing stuff, you know, in the house because mm-hmm. I mm. work during the um, When I was ill with the brain thing, um, afterwards, I think it was maybe a month that I used to nap in the afternoon. And that was because it was kind of an enforced nap time because I was so fatigued anyway from the injury that, you know, I just, I, I just couldn't get past it. Now I don't do that. But there was also a point where it swiveled and I went, okay, I'm, I'm back to doing things now. And the family, I'm not blaming anybody for this, by the way, Tris, just so you know, but the family just went, oh, he's back to normal now. Yeah. So therefore, mm. in my head, I was going, okay, so I can't have naps anymore because mm. I, I'm, I've now got to crack on yeah. and blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So whilst I still work part-time at the minute, <clears throat> most of the time, um, when I come home, I just sit and have a coffee. Mm-hmm. But if I was to shut my eyes, I would panic straight away mm. i would be like oh i can't i'm you know it's it's, it's my own mental state mm. that's doing it mm. i know that. um but i think that we do we do tend to do that to ourselves as well mm-hmm. um because we know there's an expectation on us mm-hmm. and it's not that tris would come in and go why are you why are you asleep or why are you napping because mm. he doesn't i'm in bed by 10 every yeah. night i mean he's every in bed night. by 10 every night, every night. without yes. fail <clears throat> Even on holiday, I go to we, bed at we, 10 o'clock. I, I don't know if I told this story in the podcast after our um, cruise hour, but on the cruise, um, we we took part in a, uh, the equivalent of Mr. and Mrs. on board. It's called Love, Love and Marriage. Um, and one of the questions was, there's a parrot in your room. What is the last thing? What is the last thing that parrot says when you turn out the light? So meaning, what is the last thing that's said in your room parrot hears, yeah. that the parrot hears every and, night? Every night? And Tris went, he did a snoring noise. And I said, when, when asked a question, because he was the one that was asked originally and I was in the soundproof booth thing, and I came out and I went, where have you been? That was my response to it. Because I don't go to bed at 10 o'clock. I go to bed at midnight, let's say. And every night, if Tris is awake or he stirs or I've made a noise or whatever, where have you been? Well, where the hell do you think I've been? I've been downstairs watching telly. But because we're I on the crew... Th- I, get, I get it. Al says to me, he always goes... What time did you go to bed last night? I said, I don't know why. I, 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 got, I was tired. I was tired and I came to bed. I didn't need to look at the clock. And he, he, like all these years of marriage, and he still says, what time did you come to bed last night? I don't know. Do I don't think know. After 20 odd, 30 odd years, they would get that actually we're, out, we're night owls, yeah. they're not. Go yeah. over it. It wouldn't really change just because you say what time. Absolutely. On the, on the cruise, because... Um, they they have the LGBT qua nights. Um, so every night at ten o'clock, all the gays and the lesbians and transgender and all that they all meet up in the same place and we have drinks and stuff like that. And it's a really lovely social event. It just brings people together. Um, but after that's finished, we go up to club. You do, okay. but Trace goes to bed. I, yeah. So some of the that, and of course there was a time change on the cruise as well. So it, like because you were gradually going over the Atlantic, so it was changing an hour every night. So every night it was. 3 3 a.m. officially, I was getting in from the club, but it was actually 4 a.m. because of the time. <laughs> and I like to get up and go for breakfast at 7 because the breakfast at 7 on the ship is the eggs benedict, blah, blah, blah. It's the nice breakfast rather than the scrum on the top deck, which is later. And did I not go? And it, and, and it used to finish at 10, and three mornings we managed to scrape in at 5 to 10 yeah. with himself. And the staff would be rolling. But I think eyes. that's 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 a that's a very good balance yeah. on it all. But um, yeah, well, well, it uh, well, I'm definitely with Scott there. Oh, and yeah. that one. I'm so glad oh. I'm never going on a cruise with you three. I would like to go on a cruise. <laughs> I would like to go on a cruise with well, you. Definitely. You need to get you need to get Leah to agree to go on a cruise with you, Paula, and then the four of yeah. us can go on a cruise. We really yeah. love it. We really mm. love it. Yeah. Well, I'm off to Australia soon. I know, yeah. That's your highlight for next year, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm conscious that we've we've done our hour. We've done our hour. Who's going to be the gatherer when you're in Australia? That's my question. 
Oh, don't worry. I'll keep. I'll keep this ship afloat. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be a Captain Blythe. It was funny because Rosa said, when I said I'm going away, I'm going to Australia for three weeks. And she went, mm, that's going to that's gonna make them all think, isn't it? And, and about oh. him as well. And he went, what does she mean? What does she mean? <laughs> I, I find it deeply insulting. I, like, there was a time, in, well, I can cook tea for like nine people. Like, I'm not, a, I'm a fully functioning adult. And a friend of ours was like, she would, she would say, I cook tea for six people tonight. And I was going, I do it, nine people. I can do it. Honestly. It'll be a tight ship. It'll be pot noodles for Christmas yeah, Sunday I'm dinner. Sure. You yeah, can have any yeah. choice you so, want. Quiet. So if I'm out till, say, six, seven o'clock, I come in, and what, what? I'm greeted with is three dogs <laughs> running around my feet, three cats yeah. sitting, looking at me like this. I say, have you, did you feed the cats? No, I didn't feed the cats. Did you feed the dogs? No. I don't feed the dogs. It's going to be fine. Uh, we'll maybe do a video diary every day. Day three in the court's house. But, um, <laughs> it'd be like Lord of, but, like you know, Lord of the Flies. Like, like I think I'm not kind of worried about the family. It's, it is the animals because, because you know, you've got cats, right? I've yeah. got three cats with three different needs. They've all got special needs. <laughs> and so, you know, one needs lifted up to be fed and feeds like about 10 times a day, tiny bits. The other one. And so, I've, I, you know, he'll go. I'm not bothered. There's the food there. Kirsty just puts loads and loads of pouches. Well, of course, you know cats. You know, you know, you know cats. Cats go over, and if it's been there for half an hour, it's like I'm not eating that. Yeah, so absolutely. you know, it's it's like I go. I think wow, I'm going to come home to all these dead animals when I get back because that know. would be a genuine tragedy. <laughs> um, I, well, on that note, to be fair, I think it sounds <laughs> sounds very similar to our house because you know I I'll, I'll come home, I'll do laundry, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll get dinner ready, um, I'll feed the animals. I mean, we don't have the dog to worry about anymore because obviously um, we lost him just beginning of October. Mm. So that, in some ways, sad as it was at the time, he was getting too old, and, yeah. and it was it was just bless him. He was just not you know mm. he should he shouldn't have let him go as long as we did. But anyway, um, I could be doing all of that. Right, and then Tris will come in. Um, the water bowl's empty in the hallway for the cats. <laughs> Tell us, Tris. Rather than rather than just picking up the fucking excuse my language. <laughs> oh, la, la. <laughs> uh. <laughs> rather than just picking up the balls and go and fill them up, it has to be pointed out that these balls are empty. Yeah, so I'm with you, Paula. And, oh. and Brandon, Brandon just comes in and tips loads of biscuits into the cat balls, like what? so that they're overflowing. I'm like, they didn't even need it. See, I, I just come home and do my KPI checks. So keep <laughs> performance in the game. Performance in the game. Um, yeah. I've got a solution to all of this. Why don't you come over like a like a modern day Nanny McPhee Scott and uh, yeah. or a or a Mrs. Doubtfire? You could be your own version of Mr. Doubtfire. I think wife swap. See see who see who's you know. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. I think yeah. he and Tris would be the perfect match. We'd be just yeah. <laughs> like, by ten o'clock. Eric and like Eric and Ernie in bed. Getting up at seven. Striped pajamas. Getting up at seven o'clock for your breakfast. <laughs> perfect. Oh God, yes. Well, it's been an absolutely wonderful podcast as always. Uh, Paul has overshared, and I've been chastised across the internet. <laughs> um, I'll not be able to show myself in public without a sense of uh, shame and uh, embarrassment at my parent, my husbandry skills. Um, yeah. It's been lovely to have you, Paul. It's lovely to have you, Tris. Lovely to have you, Scott. And uh, uh, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, we'll speak to you all soon. We'll speak to you this time, maybe next, next year. year. Maybe, 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 maybe. See how maybe. it goes. Yeah, see what happens. Excellent. Bon Jovi. Bon Jovi. <laughs> <laughs>